good afternoon. Uh, I'm a correspondent with Thomson Reuters in New York uh, covering global investing, economic, and uh, foreign policy. And today, <clears throat> well, just to prime the pump, as I say, we have global investors pouring cash into equities over the last 18 to 24 months or so in response to loose monetary policies uh, of the world's major central banks. That's a frustration of, uh, of a lack of better alternatives, perhaps, as, as, and that's lifted stocks to record highs. Uh, and many believe the bets that economic and corporate earnings growth will be soon justified, uh, uh, sorry, will soon justify those lofty levels. And at the same time, yields on sovereign bonds plumb multi-year lows, uh, driven in large part by expectations that global economic growth and deflation are still not responding to stimulus. So this has been exacerbated by the geopolitical ructions that politicians, central bankers, investors, and, and well, I think just generally most anyone of good conscience, conscience is concerned and appalled. So in short, the impact to and the response from uh, the Great Recession still lives with us. However, recent developments in central bank policy show a growing divergence. Rates are poised to rise in the United States, while Europe moves haltingly through the process of addressing its weak economic growth and fiscal austerity. The two are not mutually exclusive. Meanwhile, in Japan, just overnight, the BOJ drove a short-term interest rate in, uh, below zero, essentially paying to lend money to the market. And this steps up an already unprecedented effort to inject some inflation into its economy. So this afternoon, we have the pleasure of hearing from one of the world's preeminent investors and the chairman of the Japan Society, Wilbur Ross. In this forum, he needs little introduction, and today we'll hear his views on central bank policies. A private, a private equity investing titan with a specialty in distressed assets, Mr. Ross, his firm, W.L. Ross & Co., has been investing in Japan for over 17 years. So please, welcome Wilbur Ross to the stage. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, the chart on the screen is a real illustration of the different ways the various central banks have responded to the crisis at different points in time. I'll leave it up for your easy reference during the talk, and you'll be relieved to hear it's the only slide we're going to put up, so <laughs> you, won't, you won't be too bombarded. The Federal Reserve Bank, as you can see in the chart, it re-accelerated its activity in 2012. But when it announced on June 13th, 2013, that it would begin tapering its 85 billion per month purchases of US Treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities, the Dow Jones Industrial Average immediately dropped 560 points. Since then, there have been $10 billion monthly reductions, and the program will soon end. Yet, as you know, equity markets are hitting all-time highs, yields on treasury bonds make new lows daily, and the U.S. economy is slowly getting stronger. Meanwhile, Bank of Japan has been the most aggressive buyer as you can see from the chart, their total balance sheet now equals almost half the gross domestic product of the country, an extraordinary percentage. But that economy is still struggling. And the European Central Bank constantly talks about quantitative easing, but has not yet bought a single bond in quantitative easing. Most recently, ECB did go to an unprecedented negative overnight interest rate and said it will now begin to buy asset-backed securities in October. The first question, therefore, is what was the real impact of quantitative easing? The most optimistic study I've seen is that long-term yields were reduced by about 200 basis points, two percentage points. And that is a reduction which the Congressional Budget Office estimates affects GDP 
by more than one percentage point per year. Former Fed Chairman Bernanke said in 2011 that the second round of asset purchases lowered long-term interest rates itself by close to 30 basis points. He also estimates that each hypothetical unanticipated 25 basis point cut in the Fed Fund's target causes a 1% rise in broad stock indices. On the reverse side, Carlos Rosa of the New York Fed calculates that a 100 basis point increase in the yield on five-year treasuries would cause a 5.3% drop in the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index. The impact of monetary policy on markets, therefore, is clear, but its impact on individual sectors of the economy varies greatly. McKinsey Global Institute estimated that quantitative easing added between one and three percentage points to GDP, that it reduced unemployment by one percentage point and avoided deflation. But surprisingly, according to McKinsey, the major beneficiaries of low rates were actually governments, the US, the UK, and the Eurozone governments, which saved $1.6 trillion in interest expense through 2012 and more since then. As a result, sovereign and corporate bond prices in the US, UK, and Eurozone appreciated by $16 trillion. Meanwhile, non-financial corporations saved $710 billion of interest, but households, surprisingly, lost $630 billion. The reason is that benefits to the indebted younger households were more than offset by reduced interest income to older households. U.S. house prices, according to McKinsey, were boosted 15% despite tighter credit standards and oversupply. Eurozone banks' net interest margin declined $230 billion from 2007 through 2012, while the U.S. bank's interest margin during the same period rose by $150 billion. And this helps explain why Europe's banking crises continued while U.S. banks became stronger. The effect of these huge numbers, however, was blunted by countervailing factors. For example, U.S. unemployment in June was the lowest post-crisis, but participation in the workforce also dropped, in that case, to a 36-year low. There were 4.6 million job openings in the U.S. in the second quarter of 2014. That's the most in seven years. But technological advances have limited employment opportunities for the less well-educated. 80% of college graduates are in the workforce, but fewer than 50% of the people without a high school degree consider themselves to be in the workforce. Manufacturing jobs used to be the high wage positions for less well-educated people, but there are eight million fewer such jobs since 1980. Also, low-wage jobs were 22% of those lost in the recession, but 44% of those gained back since then, while high-paying jobs were 41% of those lost, but only 
of those gained. A second factor is that Social Security disability payments have soared, with half of the 4.9 million dropouts claiming such hard-to-measure disabilities as back pain and psychological problems. Some dropouts collect other government social benefits, the total of which rose from the 30-year average of roughly 12% of personal income in the U.S. to a peak of almost 18% during the recent recession. <clears throat> it has declined only slightly since then. And 46.2 million Americans, 14.8% of the population, are on food stamps, the so-called SNAP program. This amounts to one half percent of our gross domestic product. The practical problem caused by lower workforce participation is that in order for the economy to grow, every three employed people must lug along two who are not. In addition, the U.S. banks have not transmitted monetary policy to the real economy. Central banks make money available and cheaper so that it will be borrowed and spent, creating economic growth. But the banks generally have lent, kept, have lent their trillions of dollars of excess reserves overnight to the Fed so the money never hit the real economy. Reason is that bankers were still shell-shocked from the financial crisis and were so beaten upon by Congress, the regulators, and attorneys general that they tightened credit standards. These credit constraints reversed the deteriorating credit standards which had artificially boosted the economy through 2007. Back in 1983, the highest income 5% Americans had 80 cents per dollar of income in debt, and the bottom 95% had only 60 cents of debt per dollar of income. But by 2007, the top 5% cut their indebtedness to 65 cents per dollar of income, while the bottom 95% more than doubled their indebtedness relative to income to $1.40 per dollar of income. Between 2003 and 2007, homeowners withdrew $1.1 trillion from the value of their houses by refinancing their mortgages at lower rates. The next complication is our largest population block, the 20-something-year-old millennials. Unlike baby boomers, they're forming families later, having fewer children, and therefore are less interested in buying a home despite low interest rates. And home building has been one of the weakest parts of our economy. If homes built last year just equaled the long-term average of 1.5 million new homes, gross domestic product would have been one percentage point higher and unemployment would have been one percentage point lower. The problem is not oversupply from the earlier housing boom. In fact, for the entire period 2002 through 2013, that period is cumulatively two million homes below trend despite the overbuilding in the earlier part of the period. These structural problems 
have blunted the impact of quantitative easing and also make it difficult to push inflation up toward 2%. For years, productivity has grown at 3.5% a year and wages only 2%. In July, wages finally rose by 2.6%, but it's too early to tell if this begins a new trend. The next question is, why Treasury rates continued to decline this year despite the tapering. A major reason is supply and demand. Since December 2013, net Treasury issuances plus agency mortgage-backed security issuances have dropped by much more than the amount of the tapering and they actually have caused a bit of a shortage of both types of securities. There will be a harder test next year because QE will have ended, but it's unlikely that issuances will continue to decline. To put this into perspective, $85 billion of monthly purchases for a year meant $1 trillion and $20, million, $1 trillion and $20 billion of buying power. About half of that continued in 2014, so there will be another big decline in buying next year, just when the Fed may be beginning to raise short-term rates. <coughs> but. 45% of all sovereign debt in the whole world now yields less than 1%. So international investors very well may buy more treasuries and perhaps offset the end of quantitative easing. In contrast to the Fed, the ECB has spoken boldly but has been strongly risk averse. As you can see in the chart, over the last two years, its balance sheet has shrunk by 10% of the Eurozone's gross domestic product. And in the Greek bailout, ECB canceled part of the privately owned bonds, but insisted on preserving the full amount of bonds it held, even though it had bought them at very large discounts from par. More recently, ECB forced 47.5% of all deposits over 100,000 euros in the banks in Cyprus into common stock and prohibited withdrawals of the remaining deposits for extended time periods. <coughs> Meanwhile, Mario Draghi governor of this ECB repeatedly said he would do, quote, whatever was necessary, but as I mentioned, so far has bought no QE bonds. Perhaps he was stalling until the banks became better equipped to transmit quantitative easing to the real economy. The Asset Quality Review will be released in October, and in anticipation of it, uh, the banks have raised many billions of euros of new equity. And the ECB waited until two weeks ago to retain BlackRock to advise on a program for buying what it described as simple and transparent asset-backed securities. However, more than 70% of the 114 billion euros of asset-backed securities issued in the first half of 2014 already serve as collateral for ECB loans. So I believe that the effect of that program may not be very significant unless European that ECB buys the most junior tranches and thereby removes the whole securitization from the bank balance sheets. 
I have no idea whether they have any intention of doing that, but if they don't, I doubt that this will have much effect. Meanwhile, the very anticipation of quantitative easing in the EU has driven yields even on weaker credits, such as Spain and Italy's sovereign debt, to below those of the US Treasury. And the German two-year Bund is actually trading at a negative interest rate. The euro has weakened 5% as a result of all this since May, thereby boosting EU exports. Now, in fairness, the EU ECB confronted three unique problems. The prior failure of bank regulators to assure asset quality, extremely high loan to deposit ratios, and of course, Europe's sovereign debt crisis. The European regulators relied too heavily on management's evaluation of loan credits, whereas US bank examiners carefully evaluate the way managements have classified loans. And combining poor asset quality with high loan to deposit ratios proved to be a deadly formula. US bank loans rarely exceed 90% of deposits but European banks had far more loans than deposits. For example, Bank of Ireland's peak ratio was that loans were 170% of deposits. Therefore, a given amount of non-performing loans was almost twice as high relative to equity as in America. The second problem with the banks was illiquidity. These excess loans were funded by hot money, principally from money market funds. And in the European banking crisis, these funds stopped renewing CDs and the interbank lending market came to a halt. At the same time, Northern European savers started to withdraw funds from Southern European banks. The ECB provided some liquidity, but did so by means of well-collateralized loans to the banks. And at the same time, the Troika required banks to reduce their loan-to-deposit ratios, causing European banks, instead of extending more loans, to sell loans even good loans. Bank of Ireland, for example, sold 10 billion euros of performing loans at a discount of 8%, 92 euro cents on the dollar. Such sales reduced the ECB's risk, but it made bank credit less available, and that largely offset the positive impact of lower rates. Think about it. If you get turned down for a loan, it doesn't make any difference whether you got turned down in a 5% interest rate environment or a 3% environment. In either case, you got no borrowing. Meanwhile, the sovereign debt crisis caused the EU's fiscal deficits to shrink to 2.5% of GDP. This slowed the economies as well and in addition imposed further losses on the banks, especially the Greek default. Subsequently, the ECB again extended some very well collateralized long-term loans to banks with the proceeds supposedly dedicated to new lending. And meanwhile, the banks raised lots of equity, generating excess reserves. But just as in the United States, they lent these reserves to the ECB overnight rather than to customers. To deal with this, ECB recently took the unprecedented step of charging banks for the privilege of depositing funds there, but even doubling the negative interest rate 
has not done very much good. So at the big Jackson Hole conference of central bank governors, Mr. Draghi more or less demanded that EU governments coordinate structural and fiscal reforms with each other and with the ECB. He made it clear that monetary policy alone was not powerful enough to solve Europe's woes. Credit markets interpreted this favorably, and yields on everything declined sharply, again proving that financial markets are much easier to move than economies. I believe that Mr. Draghi is correct, and that unless EU leadership acts accordingly, many member states will remain in recession, and it will be more and more difficult to deal with the 6% of the total labor force that has been unemployed for more than a year. Think about it, more than 6% unemployed for more than a year, that's roughly equal to our total unemployment ratio. So it's a big chronic problem. I was especially impressed by Draghi's observation that the countries with the most flexible labor laws reduced unemployment the most rapidly. Clearly, laws in many of the countries that were intended to protect, protect workers turned out to be counterproductive. These are unique problems which the US did not face, nor did Japan. In, in either, neither country were the banks as overleveraged as in Europe, and European businesses are twice as dependent on banks as our companies in the US. Though quantitative easing is new to the US and the EU, it is old news to the Bank of Japan, which went in and out of it, as you can see from the chart, and now is strongly back in. Abenomics, including QE, initially caused a huge rise in the Nikkei average from the end of November 2012 to May of 2013. And as I mentioned before, the BOJ's balance sheet is now almost 50% of the gross domestic product of the country. All of that drove the yen lower relative to the dollar by a lot. But for the first time, a declining yen so far has failed to improve Japanese exports because so many companies had moved production offshore. Then on April 1st, Japan raised the VAT from 5% to 8. This showed Mr. Abe's determination to deal with Japan's high level of sovereign debt. But unfortunately, its near-term effect on the economy was quite negative. True, retail sales boomed by 6% in the last low-rate month, but then dropped 6.4% in April and continued to slump until July when they rose a half a percent year over year despite Typhoon Neogori. Nonetheless, June quarter GDP dropped at the huge annual rate of 7.1%, and the yen has fallen by 3.7% more since mid-August to about 106 yen to the dollar, the lowest since the Lehman crisis itself. One bit of good news is that Japanese people now respond in surveys that they believe inflation will approach BOJ's 2% target over the next two years. And the first sign of wage inflation was in July's 2.5% increase, the best gain in 17 years. The lag in wage gain is surprising because Japan's 
unemployment rate is really effectively full employment. Now, July's gain was mainly in one-time bonuses. So what's really needed is for base wages to go up to have a sustained impact on consumer spending. I believe that unless base wages do increase soon, the best way to jumpstart the Japanese economy would be joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But to do that, Mr. Abe must further reform the politically powerful agricultural sector. Hopefully he will deal with agriculture before his currently solid 50% approval rating declines. And next year, he's got another big decision to make because there's a scheduled increase in VAT from 8% to 10. But unless the economy improves, it may have to be postponed. Last week's cabinet changes re-emphasized Mr. Abe's focus on reforms, especially of the healthcare system and Japan's $1.3 trillion national pension fund. And the inclusion of so many women in the cabinet also symbolizes his determination to increase female participation in the workforce and in the executive ranks. But he needs more detailed initiatives than these symbolic moves and coining the phrase women economics. Hopefully, tangible measures will be forthcoming. I hope this tour of three major central banks illustrates how complex and difficult their task is and how other phenomena can offset monetary policy. Elected officials around the world must recognize that central banks do not shoot silver bullets. Monetary policy needs to be reinforced by complementary fiscal policy and most importantly, by structural reform. That may be the most important lesson that we can learn from the recent recession and the experiments with unconventional monetary policy. The second most important lesson may turn out to be that if we make the banks too safe, we may be endangering the whole economy. Finally, ever since the Weimar Republic, central bankers have worried about runaway inflation. But globalization, technological innovation, and excessive sovereign debt may mean that deflation is what we should fear the most and try to combat the most in the future. Thank you very much. Um, an interesting look at, at the three major central banks, but the last bit you spoke about Japan. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the BOJ's policies and the quote unquote pay any price to break the back of deflation. Uh, simply enough, is, is Japan getting enough from Abenomics at this point? What's holding it back? Well, I think what's holding it back is history. Japan has been in more or less in a deflationary mode for about as long as I can remember. Now, at my age, your memory fades, so there may have been a period before that. But I think what they have done a very good job is what I mentioned in the surveys. They have, to some degree, changed the psychology. If you took that same survey two years ago, before Abenomics, nobody would have said there'd be 2% inflation within two years. So there has been progress changing that. What I think is missing is he, uh, Mr. Abe did a pretty good job in the spring jawboning the large companies, trying to get them to increase wages. They did make some progress with the bonuses, but we haven't seen sustained increase in the wages. And that's a problem. That's a problem um, here in the United States as well. It's a problem in the United States as well, indeed. But 
it's a problem that to some degree all the developed countries are facing. Japan, of course, has the other problem, which is it's the old, eldest and most rapidly aging of the economies. Mm -hmm. So you're having more and more people move into a period where they have to live off their savings as opposed to making more earnings. So that's like in the US where three working people have to lug along two non-workers. It's almost that bad in, in Japan. Uh, this, this idea of divergence in policy that I referenced earlier, um, as an investor, uh, where does this make you look for opportunity? And more importantly, where do you avoid? Well, what it's done in our case is kind of driven us to the periphery of Europe. Uh, right after the crisis, we were very active buying banks in the United States, mostly with FDIC approval. I think we probably bought more banks under those circumstances than uh, any other private equity firm. But now that the US system is pretty well healthy, um, we started to move to Europe. So we helped uh, Richard Branson buy Northern Rock from the UK government for Virgin Money, which has proven to be a very good thing. We then went into Bank of Ireland at a time when the sovereign debt there was yielding close to 15%. And that, that Ireland has now turned around pretty well. In fact, Ireland is the country that Mr. Draghi emphasized when he talked about how important uh, flexible labor policies are to recovering jobs after the recession. Then after Ireland, most recently, we bought into Eurobank in Greece, and then quite recently into the Bank of Cyprus, which I also had mentioned in, in the talk, was really very severely uh, hurt uh, by the Troika's policies. So we've been going farther and farther into the uh, periphery. Mm -hmm. And I think in a sense, that's what most investors have been doing. You see emerging market debt trading at very low yields. You see high yield bonds trading at very low yields and at low, unusually low premiums to already low treasuries. People have become desperate for rate of return. And I fear that in the debt markets, it all too often, people are substituting coupon for creditworthiness. And I think that a few years from now is going to have a severe consequence uh, on their portfolios. Is that a, as a function as the U.S. heads towards that higher rate environment? Do you see a big impact for emerging markets or is it pretty well telegraphed and insulated at this point? Well, the, the emerging markets are inherently very volatile. Sure. They, they track better with NASDAQ or some sort of small stock index than they do with Dow Jones or anything else. And some of the countries have individual problems. We've all read about what's going on in Argentina, and you've written probably more about it than any living human being. <laughs> um, but Brazil has some serious problems. A lot of those countries have run into significant problems of one kind or another. Most importantly, by the decline in the bull market for commodity prices. Many of the more successful emerging market countries like Brazil were very natural resource dependent. I'd like to make sure that we have time for questions to the audience. So just with a proviso that given that we do have a limited amount of time, please say who you are, your affiliation, make it a short question, and please make sure that it is a question. <laughs> so do I have any hands? Um, We'll start, how would you like to do it? Maybe one, one at a time or? Sure, yeah, yes, right. I'd rather do one at a time. Okay, uh, this gentleman <laughs> right here. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone, please. What would you estimate would be the effect of a drop in the corporate uh, tax rates from 35% to say 20 or even 15%? I'm thinking specifically of the Two trillion dollars is held overseas by uh, American corporations 
and what the effect would that have on uh, investment by corporations in the U.S., employment, uh, and the GDP. Okay, well, a couple of questions there. In terms of if it were just the corporate tax rates that went down and nothing else happened, it would obviously be a tremendous stimulus to the economy for a couple of reasons. One would enhance corporate profitability and cash flow beyond even where it is. And second, it would increase somewhat the federal deficit. And if you believe in fiscal policy as stimulating the economy, it would accomplish that. But I think it's very, very remote that even if Republicans get hold of the Congress, I doubt that you would just have a reduction in corporate tax and nothing else uh, to offset it. I think the probabilities are that if they did reduce the basic rate, they'd change some of the deductions, they'd change something to have it come out more or less uh, balanced. So I, I think while the hypothetical would be very powerful, I very much doubt it would happen in that fashion. In terms of the repatriation of uh, the money that's bottled up outside the US, I think the problems are twofold. One is that our rates uh, are about the highest in the world. And that's a discouragement. And it's why companies are doing these things like inversions and all that. The real problem isn't so much with the corporations trying to minimize their tax. I think that's a perfectly legitimate concept. The real problem is our tax rates are too high and that discourages people from reinvesting in the US. So think about it, if you can invest in a more rapidly growing country with lower labor costs and a lower tax rate, why on earth wouldn't, would you put the factory anywhere but in one of those countries? It just makes sense. So I think what we really do need is overall tax reform. And instead of the, what seems to be a popular concept now of using taxes somehow to punish people and companies that have succeeded. I think we ought to figure out a way to use the tax system to foster economic growth. I think that would be better national uh, policy. That gentleman right there. <clears throat> thank you. Baldas from BGD Holdings. Well, well, thank you for your thoughtful remarks. Uh, Larry Summers, in recent times, has been raising this issue of secular stagnation and fundamentally making the point, which I think you'd agree with, that uh, a, a, the logic behind quantitative easing and the monetary policies that we have seen has a more demand side, demand creating side impetus to it. In fact, yesterday in the FT, Larry Summers writes that there may be a supply side constraint that is building which will hemorrhage medium to long-term growth even at a 2% rate, unless you begin to really do some fundamental structural reforms outside of the monetary policy arena, immigration, tax reform, better uh, childcare policies. Those are some of the issues. There are five, six things he lays out. I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts on that. Thank well, you. Well, uh, as I said, I, I very much agree with uh, Mario Draghi that there are structural reforms needed, some here in the US, a lot in uh, Europe, particularly in, in some of the Southern European countries. Um, so I, I am a believer that you should have a coordination between fiscal policy and monetary. But I do think it's also right that the central bank should be technically independent from the politicians, because otherwise they're going to be very tempted to use it just as a crutch. Remember back to the early part of the talk where I spoke about the McKinsey report, the biggest beneficiaries of quantitative easing were the governments, because they're the biggest borrowers, therefore they got the biggest benefit from tax reduction. And it's the real, one of the major reasons why the budget deficit in the US has gone down from where it had been. Because not only is the government paying less on its debt, it's also capturing uh, 
the profits that the Federal Reserve Bank is required by law to turn over to it. When the Federal Reserve was borrowing money from the banks at 50 basis points and buying long-term bonds at 300 basis points, you can imagine the spread they were making, probably 100 or so billion dollars a year flowing to the Treasury. So it's weird that quantitative easing, which was really intended to stimulate the private sector, did more, had more benefit to the public sector than it did to private. This gentleman in the front. Thank you. I'm uh, Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for International Finance. Uh, picking up on your phrase that uh, maybe we should fear deflation, I'm wondering to what extent you think that Fed policy may be about to make a mistake given last quarter was very strong, this quarter may be strong. In my mind, those are just paybacks for the lousy first quarter. If, if they look at strong quarters, maybe they will raise rates prematurely. Is that a, is that a risk? Well... It, there's a risk either way. There's a risk they'll do it too soon, and there's a risk they'll do it too late. Um, my guess is, given Janet Yellen's uh, particular focus on unemployment, I very much doubt that she'll make the mistake of doing it too soon. I think ending quantitative easing is a very different matter from also raising the short-term rates. Uh, the Fed has much better control over short-term rates and um, can do that judiciously and also can change that on a dime. So it's the most flexible tool that they have. The problem with it right now is now that you're essentially at zero rates, there's very little more they could do short-term for stimulation, and that's why they tried the experiment of the longer term markets. But on that question, which is on every, every investor's mind, looking at the market uh, predictions, second or third quarter of next year, where do you fall on that calendar? I, I think probably right around the end of the second quarter. Mm -hmm. June, July. Now that's, that's based on the assumption that the economy will grow well north of 2%, but less than 3% annual rate, and that it, it, it unemployment will continue to edge down, partly because it really is, and partly I, I don't think that labor force participation is gonna go back up in a very meaningful way. So I think the, the question the Fed has been grappling with, if you read all the minutes of the speeches at Jackson Hole, the conference, the whole question they have is how much slack is there in the labor market? And to the degree that there's a lot of slack, there's plenty of, of room. To the degree that maybe I'm more right that there's less slack, that means sooner might be better than later. So do you think then, talking about slack in the market, the expectation that wage growth is gonna come back? Yeah, well, do you I, expect, I mean, how meaningful do you think that wage growth will be? I, I don't think it's going to be overwhelming for the reasons that I described. Uh, hourly wage growth has not been going up very much at all. I think the last statistic it went up six cents an hour on a base of something like $24 an hour. That's not a, that's barely a measurable mm -hmm. uh, impact. Um, I do think there's getting to be more and more structural uh, unemployment uh, because people are, the schools are not giving people the skills that they need to find reasonable jobs in a more technologically advanced economy. And then there's a peculiarity of our social welfare system. If somebody is getting food stamps and all these other benefits, the, earned, uh, the tax refunds and all that, as they begin to earn money in those early tranches, their effective tax rate on the incremental money they own gets to be almost 100%. So there's a specific disincentive 
for people getting a big bundle of these social benefits to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Who would go back to work to make only a few pennies difference from doing nothing? Well, that's a, uh, there's some social questions there as well. as just well, economic pride and, and such. That, that, that's true, but uh, dollars are pretty powerful. That's true. Next question. This gentleman. Uh, two very brief questions. I'm uh, sorry, tell me who you are. And uh, yes, I'm James Lee, and I work in finance here in New York. I'm with Boutique Investment Bank. Uh, do you see any, any risk you know, to the global economy you know, similar to what happened uh, in 2008? Do you see any kind of like systemic you know, risk to the global economy? That's my first question. And second, I would love to hear uh, your well, thoughts. Systemic risk from what? I don't know. I mean, oh, okay. uh, that's a question. I mean, do you see any risk? Uh, and my second question is, what do you think about, about long-term trends in the prices uh, for gas and oil uh, you know, in the energy markets? OK. Well, th those questions to answer thoroughly would take about a week. But I'll try to give a very short uh, version. I, I, I think, if anything, we're pushing the banks too far with all the new measures, the risk-weighted assets, the capital asset reserves, all this stuff, putting special high capital requirements on the, most, on the biggest banks, uh, all those things are going to be fine from a risk mitigation point of view if you define the risk as being those institutions blowing up. My concern is politicians are very good at solving last year's problem and less good at trying to anticipate this year's problem. And I think last year's problem, or a couple years ago problem, was the one that banks got a little bit out of control. Now, the way the politicians talk about that, you would think there was no banking regulation whatsoever. So I think there's plenty of complicity, implicit or explicit, on the part of the banking regulators that they let this whole thing get to where they did. But that's not something they like to talk about. They like to talk about the bad uh, bankers. So I think there's minimal risk of the, the financial system blowing up in that sense. I think where there's a, a lot of risk is what I tried to mention a little in the talk, namely that by making the financial system so safe, and so overcapitalized and so timid that you don't get the relaxation of credit that you need to get business going. Banking inherently consists of taking in short-term deposits and making long-term loans. That's the nature of it. That's what it's always been. It's the only way they can really make a spread, with the exception the other way to make a spread is to take a risk in lending. So if you pretty well kept them from taking real risks in lending, they are going to take the, the timing mismatch risk. But I don't see that blowing up the system. What I do think is that it's going to mean credit will eventually be more expensive and less available than it otherwise would have been. And I think that has long-term negative economic consequences. As to the price of oil and gas, uh, we are long uh, exploration and production ownership in dry gas, and that turned out to be not a very good idea so far because so much natural gas comes as a sort of free by byproduct of oil in the shale developments that they almost don't care what they get for the natural gas. So until and unless we get the granting by the administration of more natural gas export permits, of which he's only granted a handful and there's another dozen or so, if he grants all those, then prices will start to come up domestically. Because uh, price of natural gas here is $3 and some change in MCF. In Europe and in Asia, it runs between 12 and $15. And it only costs about a dollar and a half to liquefy it, transport it to those destinations, 
and then regasify it there. So there's a tremendous arbitrage uh, potential if he'll grant more licenses. So I think if he does, price of natural gas in this country will go up some and will come down in the rest of the uh, world. And maybe it stabilizes at five or so dollars somewhere in that, that range for U.S. For oil, to me, the biggest unknown is you tell me what's going to happen in the Mideast and in Russia, Ukraine, and then I could give you some idea what would happen to oil price. But we're in a world where there's always the potential for some meaningful dislocation of supply due to the armed conflicts that are going on. To the degree you had that, you could have a real spike in the price of oil. Short of that, I doubt that it goes much over 100. We have time for one more question. This gentleman in the front. Hi, my name is Jeff Nathan. I'm an MBA student at NYU Stern. Um, my question is, to your earlier point in your speech, you can see a lot of actions by the uh, Abe administration, um, recently uh, new leadership of the pension, um, they're actually buying equity indices. You know, how important do you think are, uh, is the movement of, of you know, savings into risk assets in Japan for real economic growth? And what would you be looking for to, you know, at, to see if it's kind of working? Well, Japan does need some structural reforms, most importantly in agriculture. As you know, its agriculture segment is small in population, but very powerful politically because of the way votes are weighted for the diet. Um, but it, it really needs to be fixed. It's a big burden on Japan. I think consumers would spend more on other things if food didn't take such a big bite out of their budget. And it seems almost tragic. There are 400,000 hectares of unused farmland right as we sit here. That's about as big as the whole landmass of Seiju province just to put it in perspective. If he could just activate that and put it in the hands of large-scale farming like we have in the U.S., then automation comes in, uh, proper means of fertilization come in, all kinds of things happen that would transform it. And um, not only would that be directly very good for the economy, it also would facilitate Japan's entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The two sticky points there are agriculture and <laughs> autos. And um, the autos probably getting to be less complicated as Japanese car companies move so much production offshore. But in terms of agriculture, Japan put in some a, a bilateral agreement with, I think it was either Australia or New Zealand recently, where there were some cuts in their tariff on certain kinds of agricultural imports. But the cut was from 36 or so percent to 18 or so percent. And it started to phase in over an 18 year time period. Well, Trans-Pacific Partnership's not gonna wait around for 18 years, so if that's the most they would do in a bilateral uh, treaty negotiation, I'd be very surprised if they'd re remove enough tariff barriers in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership in order to meet what they would have to do. So I'm, I'm getting a little pessimistic uh, about the TPP, even though I really do think that's as close to a silver bullet as we're gonna find for Japan near term. I, I think that, I always think of pe people who deal in distressed assets as ultimately optimists because you're looking at something and you're saying, oh, I, I see you know, value there. Hmm. So as an, uh, in, in that vein, 
Uh, turning back to Europe, uh, indulge me for one last question. Um, when you see strains in, say, uh, Germany, is it simply a question of the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Is there something deeper that, that we should be uh, looking at from your perspective? Well, Germany is going to have some issues in their banking system. I, I think when the asset quality reviews come out, if they really are strict, I think quite a few German banks are going to have some real problems. And so that's a structural, particularly the Landesbanks. Um, and I think that's a structural issue that they're going to have to deal with. To some degree, other countries are going to have that as well. But I think in Germany, it's, it's going to surprise people because we think of Germany as such a cons fiscally conservative uh, place. So I think they have that problem. What Germany has done pretty well is they've gone from what had been a very tough uh, labor regime to one where you really can work things out. They, they do have these high social benefits to people who are temporarily laid off. They've done a fairly good job of managing it, and especially with immigration. They permit a lot of Turkish workers in on a short-term basis, and as the economy gets a little stiffer, they send them back out home. So the domestic Germans don't really feel the problem. And I, I think in a lot of ways, while Germany is fairly socialistic, I think they've had some pretty good policies that make the system a little bit more flexible. That's something positive to end on. Wilbur Ross, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.